Good afternoon to all of you here and to those that will view this video sometime later. It is good to be able to come together on the Sabbath day to have that fellowship, that oneness, that closeness, that unity that comes through God's Spirit, that we are of one mind and think like we should, hopefully, and our minds are on God and His great plan of salvation and as we are fast approaching the Holy Day season here in the fall. It will be exciting to be able to see everyone once again at the feast as we go up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And for those who are unfamiliar with those terms, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, or whatever, we do have the information available on our website and in our literature that you could peruse and come to understand even greater in-depth knowledge of the plan of salvation. That's not my topic today. I've been thinking about a subject that has been afflicting Virginia for this past months of the summer, and that is drought. Virginia is in a drought. Farmers are beginning to sell off their cattle. Crops are failing because we just haven't had the rain. There have been those areas across the middle section of the United States that have had plenty of rain. Uh, in fact, too much rain. Floods across Illinois and Indiana. Floods that have afflicted people. But in Virginia, and where I, especially where I live in the northern Shenandoah Valley, we have not had much rain since May less than a couple inches, I believe, and it just has not been enough to keep the pastures green and growing and the gardens producing, and we are facing a very severe drought. What would happen if that drought would continue? Say we did not receive any rain this fall, or snow in the winter, no rain in the spring. What kind of conditions would we truly be in after one year of no rain? We take it all for granted until the well runs dry. There isn't any more water in the ground, and then we are very deeply in thirst, and we're wondering, where's the next cup of water going to come from? Famine is the topic of today. How to survive the coming famine? God predicts famine, pestilences. If we simply turn over briefly here to Matthew, We all, as Christ spoke, what would happen as he went out on the Mount of Olives, overlooking Jerusalem, the disciples wanted to know, when, when's the, when are you coming? When are you setting up the kingdom? When will be the, the end of man's rule, and when will you take over? Dropping down, he says in verse 7 of Matthew chapter 24, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And that's all we hear about today as North Korea rattles its sabers, as Iran continues to threaten the Middle East and even us in America with a nuclear program. What happens if, if people would show up on downtown Detroit, Chicago, Houston, San Francisco, L.A., or even Washington, D.C., and New York City, with a suitcase bomb, what would happen? Nations are fighting against nations. We're at war with, with the Taliban. We're at war with the rebels, the terrorists. We're trying to stop a holocaust, if you might say, kingdom against kingdom. And then there will be famines. The topic of today, famines. We've never experienced a famine, have we? No. We've lived in this great land of America that's been rich with good crops, with the wheat simply waves in the breeze across Kansas, the breadbasket of this nation, Kansas and the Dakotas on up into Canada. We've never experienced living without food, let alone water. But if we study God's word, we find that our forefathers, the fathers of the, the faithful, Abraham, he went through famines. 
Isaac went through famines. And of course we know that Joseph was sent to prepare for a famine that Jacob, his father, knew nothing about. Jacob began to experience that famine, and he went through a couple years of it. But thankfully, Joseph had already been sent to Egypt to begin to establish a program by which mankind could survive the famine. Not just a year or two of famine, but seven years of not growing any crops. What about you and me? What would we do? Can we store up enough food for seven years, eight years, ten years? No, we can't. Should that be our goal? It's amazing. People are getting rich building survival units. I call them a unit. It's some type of prefabricated shelter. And most of them are being bought in Washington, D.C. for whatever reason, in which one person or a family or friends could live for at least three months. Self-contained unit. But what happens after three months? But what if your neighbors who aren't in that shelter decide to shoot you? Can we ever survive a famine? Physically, a famine. Can we survive? Who would be able to save up enough food? If God calls for a famine across this land, who's going to prepare in advance? And who's going to survive? Will it be only the rich who have got enough money to buy food from someplace else? Is that, is that what's going to happen? What about the poor people? What about those who are living on the land and there isn't any crops and the bears and the, and the wolves come down and consume whatever else they could find and we're left destitute without any future? Famine. We take it all for granted that it would never happen. Yet God says famines are coming and with the famines come pestilences, earthquakes, in various places. It's coming. We can read Jeremiah. We can read Isaiah. We can read God's word, and famine is coming. It's one of the tools that God uses to punish a nation. So how are we going to get ready for this famine? How are we going to get ready for a famine without food and without water? We're going to flee to another country. We're going to flee to, another, to some Pacific, South Pacific island and, and live in luxury for, for the rest of whatever time might remain alive. Or are we going off to some place of safety? Maybe that's how we're going to escape the famine, right? Wrong. You and I will survive the famine that's coming, but not because we're able to store up enough food enough water, breathe, breathable air. How do you filter air that's polluted with the chemicals of an atomic or nuclear bomb? Sure, these shelters have some type of charcoal filtering. They have ultraviolet lights, and they try to filter out the harmful effects of a nuclear blast. But for how long? I heard that if, if some satellite went over the United States, we could be without electricity for seven years. What do we do without electricity for seven years, let alone seven months? What do we do? I can't get water out of the ground. I have a deep well. It runs on electricity. We can't go down the road. We can't pump gas out of, out of the tanks without electricity. The bicycle's got a flat tire. I'd have to huff and puff to blow it up, right? Where would you and I be when this system collapses? Are you and I deeply concerned about it? Should we be concerned about it? Or should we just be blindly ignorant of the fact that a famine's coming and we don't have to do anything in advance? Oh, yes, we'd better build some type of bomb shelter. That's what we did that is, I say we, the United States of America, back in the 1950s. That was the craze. Go out in the backyard, dig a hole in the ground, pour concrete walls, and a conc make a concrete bunker, a bomb shelter. Why? Because Russia 
was going to come over here, the Soviet Union, and destroy us. And we needed to be prepared for a nuclear war. How many bomb shelters were built, and what did they do with them after they built them? Would that save us? Is that going to save us? Taking all the preparation to store up food and water, where do you go to the bathroom in this shelter? What do you do with it? People are blind to the fact that you and I cannot survive a famine without God. Plain and simple. How did Jacob survive the famine? How did Abraham survive a famine? Well, thankfully, in, the, in Abraham's time, it was a local famine. So he could move off to Egypt. He could go to, the, the, to some other country and survive the famine. What did they do with their sheep, sheep and goats? Cattle. What do you do in a famine when you've got animals to take care of? Well, as I said, Virginia, the farmers are selling their cattle off for whatever money they can receive. Why? Because they don't have the pasture, they don't have the hay, thinking down into the winter season to feed the animals. If I feed hay now, that's less I have to, to feed in the winter, or I have to buy more hay, which ups my expenses, and I'm not making any profit. As a farmer, what do we do? We sell off. People don't understand what a famine will do. In the time of Jacob, we turn over to Psalm 105. In the time of Jacob, did God come down and tell Jacob there'll be seven years of famine? Did God speak to Jacob and say, you need to store up? because there'll be seven years of famine? No, he did not. Yet, can't we say that Jacob was a servant of God? Can't we say that Jacob was in the church, church in the wilderness, the church of the Old Testament, grandson of Abraham? Abraham is the father of the faithful, called of God, called of God to come out, and God spoke and walked and talked with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. Yet here we find that Jacob knows nothing about this famine that is to come. And he's not prepared for it. But does that mean that God's going to leave him destitute? That he's going to perish because he doesn't have a foreknowledge of the famine? Psalms chapter 105, beginning in verse 16. Speaking of God, moreover, he, God Almighty, called for a famine in the land. When God says, enough's enough, this nation has sinned, I am calling for a famine. What are you and I going to do? Tell God, don't send it? What do you think Jacob was doing? He was asking God to send rain. What do you think I've been doing in Virginia? Asking God to send rain. Has he sent it? No. Very little. Does that mean God is not on his throne? That he's not deeply concerned? He's not able to send the rain? No, not at all. Is it God's fault? No. Is it God's fault that this nation is being punished? No. It's our fault that this nation is being punished. We're sinners. This nation hasn't recognized that fact. They've turned their back on God, and God says, okay, I will deal with you accordingly. He called for a famine in the land. He called for a flood, right, in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, he called for a flood. He told Noah to start building an ark. It took him 120 years to build it. When the ark was finished, God had the flood. He called for a famine. What was he going to do? Destroy mankind with a famine? No, that's not what he was going to do. He says he destroyed all the provision of bread. And we'll go back to Genesis and we will read how severe the famine was. Well, what did he do? What did God do to prepare for the famine that he was going to bring? Leave all of mankind destitute and they would perish? No. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. 
Now, isn't that contradictory? Joseph, who was going to save mankind, had to first become a slave. Now, does that ring any bells for you and me? It should. It should. You and I were slaves of Satan the devil. We were redeemed. We are to be whom? The servants of Jesus Christ. We are to be his slave. What do you and I learn by being a slave? Number one, humility. That is key. Humility. So what's going to help us get through a physical famine? It is a relationship with God, plain and simple. So how was Joseph going to be a true servant of the Almighty God and save mankind? We know that Joseph was filled with God's Spirit. He had tremendous wisdom. He also had tremendous business skills. How? How did Joseph have business skills? From whom did he learn those business skills? From his father Jacob. How did Jacob learn business skills? The hard way. He learned that you could not have a successful business by scheming and conniving and de being deceitful and stealing. He wrestled with God after serving Laban for all those years and having his wages changed and being cheated and learning how not to do things. And he wrestled with God and said, I need God in my life. He was training Joseph, the other brothers who did not want God in their lives. That's obvious. Was trained, yes, Joseph was trained by Jacob how to deal wisely with money, with cattle, with the crops, with everything. But God needed to do what with Joseph? Take some of the pride out of him. Why was his brothers angry at him? They were jealous. They were envious. Well, Joseph did not always conduct himself as a wise person. He was sold as a slave to learn humility, to learn meekness, to learn mercy, to learn kindness, to learn to be patient. All of which enabled him to be able to stand before Pharaoh. Sure, it says here, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in arms. He ended up in the dungeon. All Joseph ever wanted to do was go home. That's all Joseph ever wanted to do was just go home and be with his parents and with his family. And there was no way out. There was no way back home. Sometimes that's what you and I think. Can't we just live in the 1920s? Can't we just live in the 1950s? can we just go back to some other time. Can we restore the governments that we used to have in this country? Can we just bring back the Tea Party and revolt and uprise against socialism or whatever else is happening in this country and set it all right? And then we can live at peace and happiness forever and ever. It will not happen. We cannot go back home to some future I mean, not to some past. Look, it was said of Abraham. They, if they had thought about it, they could have had a way to go home. Go back to the land of Ur. Back into the Babylonian system. Back into corruption and deception and false government and false gods and everything else. But their eyes were focused on the kingdom. Joseph had to be focused on God. And he was in the dungeon. And he was there until the time that his word came to pass. The word of God tested him. He went through a lot of heartaches and pain to become a faithful servant of God and to become a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Joseph became a Savior to 
not only the Egyptians, but to the nations round about him. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the eternal tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house, ruler of all his possessions, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. Joseph was prepared as a slave, cast into the dungeon to become a ruler, to be able to do what was right for not only the nation of Israel, I mean Egypt, but for all the nations round about him. Let us turn to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. Beginning in verse 29, it says here, Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout the land of Egypt. As Joseph interprets the dreams, Pharaoh had two dreams, one about corn and one about cattle. Corn, or it could be grains of head, head, heads of grain, not that they necessarily was growing corn that you and I are familiar with. He interprets the dreams. He says there's seven years of great plenty coming. Now what if God told us that in five years we'd have a famine? What would you and I do? Would we try to save up for the famine? lay aside the goods that we would need to try to get through the famine? Well, we might, but is that the most important things to do? Let us continue on. But after them, seven years, verse 30, a famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following it, for it will be very severe. You and I cannot survive a, a famine, let alone a severe famine, without God. We could store up food, and it could be stolen. We could store up food, and other animals or bugs or insects could devour it. That's not salvation. So it goes on to say, here's what Joseph said, verse 33. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect 20% of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during the famine. Of course, everything sounded good to Pharaoh and Joseph rose to power and became the ruler over the agricultural industry of Egypt. The seven good years came in verse 47, brought forth abundantly. So he gathered, verse 48, up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. And Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was outnumbered. Just simply forgot how much, Just I mean, not forget how much, but just simply quit counting because there was no way to keep on counting. It was just an abundance of food. And this abundance of food was what was going to help them survive the coming famine. Verse 53, Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all the land, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. 
Then Pharaoh said to the, all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. And so all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. God had called for this famine. How did Joseph deal with it? Wisely. God had sent Joseph down into Egypt to prepare for the famine. Just like God told Noah to build an ark and prepare for a flood, Joseph was called upon to save the food for the famine so the people could live. Let's go on over here. We know that two years goes by and during those two years Joseph is dealing with his brothers. They have come to Egypt. He recognizes them. They do not recognize him, for he speaks in the language of the Egyptians. He is dressed like an Egyptian, and he is in a position of rulership, and that is definitely not where his brothers would have wanted to find him. As Joseph deals with the famine, the money runs out. Money runs out. Joseph is selling food, the grain that's been gathered up. And you might think, well, well, that's unfair. Why didn't Joseph just give back to the Egyptians the food that they had raised? Well, that is not the case. Number one, we do not know who raised the food. Joseph might have put to work a lot of people to plant every available field that could be planted during those seven years of plenty. We, God expects us to work if we are to eat. Food costs money. It had to be stored. Buildings had to be erected, greeneries, whatever. There was a tremendous amount of cost involved in preserving that food. So therefore, it was sold at a certain price. Did Joseph gouge the people? Was he out there trying to make Pharaoh rich on the backs and the expense of his fellow countrymen? No, not at all. Number one, Joseph is filled with the Spirit of God. He is going to do it fairly and wisely. Is he going to charge other countries more than he's charging the Egyptians? Not necessarily. He understands how to run a business. He understands what's involved. He understands that he must, number one, show mercy. He's filled with God's spirit. Mercy. Have compassion. The money runs out. What does he sell? Tell, you will give us, give us your livestock. And I will give you grain for your livestock in exchange. The money's gone. Hand over the animals. Now, what's, I want you to think about Egypt. Egypt is a country that depends on rain and the Nile River. The Nile River is over 4,000 miles long as it twists and winds its, its way to the Mediterranean Sea. It flows from south to north. The last part of it goes through Egypt. It would fit within the United States of America because if you took it as the bird flies, as the crow flies, it's less than 3,000 miles, just a little under. From the point of where the source to the delta. In a famine, not only do people need food, they also need water. What's the livestock doing? They're drinking precious water. They're eating precious grain. What do you, would you and I do? The money's run out. Why keep feeding livestock?
I'm not going to give you food, grain, just to, so you can keep your livestock alive. I have a better plan. I have Goshen. Now, I can't take you all down to Gosha and let you take care of your cattle. But I have a land down here that I have a family that will take care of your animals. Now, am I far-fetched? Is this in God's word? I don't want you to think. I want you to imagine. I want you to understand what Joseph is doing. Is he going to expect then that all these farmers are going to go back out and plow fields by hand? Put the plow on the, over their, put rope over their shoulder and do the plowing? Or is Joseph going to spare the livestock, put them on good pasture that's watered by the now that has not went dry? God didn't say the now was going to dry up. If the now was going to dry up, you might as well forget it. You don't need any grain. Wells may dry up, and they did during the times of famine. Why do you think Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had to keep digging wells? They'd dry up. They'd have to find some new source of water. You and I depend on water where? Well, if we live in a city, it doesn't come out of the ground. It comes out of the river. Or a lake. But I live out in the country. My water comes out of a well. I'm depending on that well not to go dry. If it goes dry, I have to dig another well. What if I don't have money to dig the well? What if they do dig and they don't find any water? What am I supposed to do? Well, God says people are going to go from city to city looking for water. What was Joseph doing? He was taking the livestock off of the ground where there wasn't any pasture anyway, taking them down to Gosha to make sure they were saved alive, where they could eat grass and not precious grain. And then, when that's all gone, he brings the people into the cities as well. You've got a logistic problem. How do you distribute food all over the countryside when there isn't any animals? So you bring the people into the cities. Why? What's the cities? Where's the cities getting their water? Out of wells? No. Out of the river now. Where's the cities built? Near the Nile River. People think, well, Joseph's mean. He, he's harsh. He's doing this because he wants to get rich. He's, he's breaking down people's lives. He's destroying them. He's not. He's saving people's lives. And he doesn't want to create a socialistic society. God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Food costs money. He expects a fair exchange for it. Well, livestock's gone. What's next? People's still going to perish. Famine's not over. We've still got a few more years to go. What are we going to do? People come to Pharaoh and Joseph and says, look, all that's left is us and our land. The land's useless as far as we're concerned. It won't grow anything. So we're going to give ourselves to you. Take care of us. And that's what he does. He takes care of the people for the rest of the famine, brings them into the cities where he can administer the food that remains, not have it squandered, not have a logistic problem of trying to distribute out to different farms of which there isn't any water maybe anyway. Bring the people in and keep them safe for the remaining of the famine. The famine is over. What's Joseph do? He gives the people seed. He says, go farm. Well, we don't have any livestock. Oh, yes, you do. He brings the livestock back out of Egypt because he's already tagged it in their ear so he knows who, what livestock belongs to which farmer. Oh, I'm crazy. I know. You don't think this happened. Well, maybe not. But think. It could have. How else would you do it? How else would you bring the nation back into productivity if you didn't spare the livestock in a place where you could and spare the people? Now, all Joseph requires is 20%. Okay, the land belongs to Pharaoh. You belong to Pharaoh. This is one nation. Let's get back to work. All Pharaoh requires is 20%. Our government takes a whole lot more than 20%. On top of that, you and I, that are Christians, are paying tithes. God expects 10%, another 10% to go up and keep the feast. 
And then every third year, 10% to take care of those who are in need. Oh, no. People think, well, that's not fair. Joseph shouldn't have done it that way. Yes, he should have. He's a servant of God. He did it a godly way. Don't be criticizing Joseph. Come to understand why he did things the way he did. Because he is a very shrewd and smart businessman. And he knows how to deal with economy. Our society doesn't. Our government wants to take us into socialism. Where the haves give to the have-nots. Until the haves don't have anything either. And that's not what Joseph did. But here's the problem. Let's turn over to Amos. Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. Here's the problem. Not only are physical famines coming, of which you and I could not provide for ourselves or our family. Just can't do it. If there isn't any electricity, there isn't any gasoline, there isn't any of these things, how are you and I going to survive a famine? Where are we going to get the food? It's not in the grocery store. Where are we going to get the water? It's not in the well. If it is, I still can't get it out. It's too deep. That's not the problem. Amos chapter 8. Because there's a famine coming, but not a physical famine. See, you and I can't even survive a physical famine. How are we going to survive a spiritual famine? And which one's more important? Well, spiritual famine, of course. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the eternal God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor of a thirst for water. Yet that's what happened in Egypt and the nations surrounding Egypt. They would run out of grain and they run out of water. And the only country available with water was Egypt because it had the Nile River. Look at the Middle East. What other country has a source of water that's almost unfathomable? Sure, given enough time, it would have run out too, but not in seven years because the source of the water was deep in the southern part of Africa. The problem was they was out of food as far as grain. They could not grow the crop. Well, God says, I'm sending a famine, but not of food and not of water but of hearing the words of eternal. People get their priorities mixed up. See, they, they run around trying to save themselves physically, trying to save themselves with storing up food in the basement, storing up water. For what? For how many months? How many years? Joseph had a hard time just getting through seven years of a famine. Yet with God's wisdom and understanding, he did it and had enough left over to plant food, have the seed to plant for the next year. Yes, a famine of hearing the words of the eternal. What do you and I do when we don't go to services? Do we just sit around the house and wait for the Sabbath to end? Because there isn't any minister? There isn't any video. There isn't anything. We just kind of crawl into our shell and, and wait for the sun to set. Are we busy working? Jesus Christ said, my father and I work. The day's coming when the night, that is the time's going to come when the night's coming and no man can work. There came a time in Joseph's life that there wasn't any food to be brought into the harvest, into the storehouses. What do you do? Well, now it's time to deal with a famine. But you and I must prepare now. We, you and I must learn how to survive a spiritual famine now. Not when it's here, but before it's here. How do you prepare for a physical famine? Like Joseph, if that's how God ordained it. But you and I cannot survive a physical famine. Not in this country. You and I can't live off the land. You and I can't go out hunting in the, in the woods. And if you, you did, the meat could be contaminated. The meat from deer may not be fit to eat. 
they could have a deadly disease. There isn't any water. No, you and I can't survive a physical famine. But you and I can survive a spiritual famine. And that's more important. As a church, we need to be prepared to survive a spiritual famine. There's coming a time when there won't be any ministries. There's coming a time when there won't be any videos. There's coming a time when this nation goes under. We owe our souls to China. China is anti-God. Oh, yeah, we, we think we've got a constitution. Our Congress is trying to do away with the constitution faster than they had the time to write it in the first place. The constitution is meaningless without God. It was inspired by God. We should respect God. We should be honoring God. We should be trusting in God. They shall wander from sea to sea, verse 12, and from north to east. Now you tell me which country is surrounded on the east and the west by sea. Wander from sea to sea. Who's he talking about? Mainly the United States of America. Oh, yes, you could say Australia. Canada, Great Britain, maybe. From north to east, they shall run to and fro, seeking the eternal, or the word of the eternal, but shall not find it. It's on the internet today. But what if the internet is shut down? When the rules become such that you cannot preach the gospel on the internet, you cannot preach the gospel in any churches, you cannot preach, you cannot teach, you cannot instruct. We throw you in jail. That's happened. Paul and Silas was thrown in jail for preaching the word of God. While he's in jail, could they preach? No. Peter was in prison too. But God spared them, brought them out of prison. He spared Joseph, brought him out of prison to do what? A tremendous work. Oh, we think we have all the answers and we don't. First Samuel chapter 3. There was a time in the history of Israel, a nation that had God had brought out of Egypt. See, there was a purpose in having Joseph sent to Egypt to prepare for a famine because God needed to take Israel into Egypt to fulfill prophecy so he could say, I have called my people, my nation, out of Egypt, which was a foretype of having Jesus Christ called out of Egypt when his parents took him down into Egypt. God works because he has a tremendous plan. If we would just open our eyes and ears to understand it. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Then the boy Samuel ministered to the eternal before Eli. And the word of the eternal was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. What does that mean? That means there is a spiritual famine. Why? Well, you know, or should know, that Eli's sons were not obeying God in their service at the, at the tabernacle. Eli was old. He told his sons, but he didn't put any, any emphasis into it. He didn't put any teeth in the law. He didn't kick them out. He didn't try to change. God wasn't with the people. This is during the period of the judges. I read the book of Judges. See how the people conducted their lives. How would you and I conduct our lives? There was a famine in the time of Ruth as well when her future husband and in-laws came into Moab. They came there because there was a famine in Israel, namely around Judah, around Jerusalem and Bethlehem. When call, God calls for a famine, what are you and I supposed to do? Prepare. He's calling for a famine in Amos. This is a wake-up call. This is a warning. A famine is coming, spiritually. What are you and I going to do? Let's turn over to Jeremiah, chapter 17. Jeremiah, chapter 17. What are we going to lay up? How deep are we going to dig the well? How much water are we going to save? No, that's not what we need during a spiritual famine. You and I need to be built on the rock. You and I need to be 
tap into the only source of salvation, which is God Almighty, his Holy Spirit. And if we're not doing that, forget it. You're not, you're not going to survive a spiritual famine. You won't even survive a physical famine. Remember, David said he never saw the righteous perish because of hunger. But if we're all geared on to how to survive physically, we've missed the boat. We'll perish. If our minds is on how we're going to get through this drought, I'm feeding hay. God has blessed me. I could buy hay. I've got enough hay for the summer and the winter. But I've sold off cattle in the spring before the drought hit. That was a blessing from God. See, it takes a relationship with God and to be prepared to be a wise steward of the natural resources that we have. Do we waste water? This nation wastes so much water. How many times have you seen going over to a, maybe a host that's preparing a meal and see him turn on the kitchen faucet and just let the water run? We take it all for granted. Take it all for granted. And that's just physical, but spiritually now. Let's focus in here on spiritualness. That's why we're here on the Sabbath. But, as I said, these, these are physical examples. They're in God's Word so we can glean and understand principles. Joseph was living a godly life, and he was doing things God's way. He's going to be in the kingdom. If he was a crook and a thief and conniving and showing partiality, no. If he didn't have any mercy, if he didn't have any compassion, and yes, God says it must begin at home. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Thus says the eternal, cursed is the man who trusts in man. Is that what you and I do? We trust in our banker. We trust in Wall Street. We trust in our government. We trust in ourselves. Oh, I think Jesus Christ gave a parable about trusting in the self. What the farmer do? He had a tremendous amount of crops. This is what Christ said. He had a tremendous amount of crops. His barns were already, already filled from last year. So he said, I'm going to tear all that down, build bigger barns. Then I'll have all enough goods. See, now he figured this was my last year I had to work. I could build bigger barns, store it all, and I can go on vacation. I don't have to be a farmer anymore. What did Jesus Christ say? He said, you're a fool. These are people who trust in themselves. Oh, I'll get through the famine. I'll take my gun and go out in the woods. I'll live off the land. I'll eat. Oh, he's going to eat what? Berries? There's a famine. Now, come on, what's growing in the woods? It's been so dry, deer don't even stay hardly in the woods anymore. They're out trying to find something green. No, people think they can survive. They cannot. Cursed is the man who trusts in himself or in another man. God says, trust no man makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the eternal. And that's exactly what this nation has done. And what is God going to say is going to happen? For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but in sh shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabitable. Is that where you and I want to live spiritually? Cut off from God, drying up, fading away, dying on the vine. We know what happens if we die on the vine. God cuts the branch off and throws it in the fire. That's the end of it. It didn't die because there was a famine and the, and, the, and the tree roots dried up. No, no, no. It died because we were not using God's Holy Spirit to overcome the sin in our lives. And because of that, we dry up and we get cut off. We don't use the Holy Spirit to show mercy to anybody else. We don't have patience with anybody else. Oh, yes. We'll forgive those that forgive us. 
Oh, yes, we'll show kindness to those who show kindness to us. We'll do good to those who show goodness to us. Tit for tat, as they say. But our enemies? Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. We can't show mercy to enemies. We can't forgive enemies. We can't do good to enemies. Yet Jesus Christ said if we don't, we're not in the kingdom. Do we show mercy to those who are in need now? Oh, we got money in the bank. What's it for? For a rainy day. What's it going to do? Because the money is perishing before our eyes. The value's gone. Oh, buy gold. Can't eat gold. Cannot do it. You and I can only live if we have God's spirit in us. And that is spiritual, not physical. So that's, that's what happens to one who trusts in somebody else or something else. In whom should we trust? Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the eternal. Not lip service. Trust. What's that mean? That's faith. Sure, I need rain. Northern Virginia needs rain. Will God send rain? Yes. If he's called for a famine, that's in his hands too. If he says it's time to move, Joe, it's time to move. The well dries up. There isn't anything in the pasture. There's nothing there to keep me there. It's time to move. Oh, no, we don't want to move. This is my place. This is my home. I don't want to change. I don't want to have to give up what I've got. God knows how to get to us. He knows how to force us to do things we don't want to do sometimes. But more, and spir- more importantly, the spiritual. Am I looking at the physical and understanding the spiritual? He says a famine's coming of the word. Am I prepared? Have I stored up for a time when there isn't any preaching of God's word? Do I understand God's word? Is it in my mind? Can I quote it? Not necessarily verbatim, but do I know the principles? Do I know the historical accounts? Can I call them to mind about Esther? What about Sarah? What about Jeremiah? Are these people real to me? Do, are, are they in my mind? Do I know what they went through and had to overcome and change? It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the eternal, who has faith in God, that God is going to deliver, no matter what Jesus Christ said. If they destroy the body, don't fear that person. Fear the God Almighty because he can destroy not only the body, but the spirit. We know that five don't make it into the wedding supper. Ten virgins. That means they have kept themselves unspotted from the world. They are following Jesus Christ. But five do not have what it takes to get through a famine. They don't have enough oil talking about physical oil in their lamps. We're, we're talking about spiritual. Oil is a symbol for God's Holy Spirit. Continue on. Blessed is the man who trusts in eternal, whose hope is the Lord. Who, what is our salvation? Who is our salvation? It is God. For he shall be like a tree planted by the water, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes and its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Spiritual famine's coming. Are we going to dry up, fade away, and cease? Or have we built the godly character now during a time of plenty to be able to continue yielding fruit. And what fruit am I talking about? The fruit of the Spirit of God. How many people don't show any mercy today? 
They won't show mercy to their own family members, and they won't show mercy to those outside of, quote, unquote, their church organization. Now, how do you like that to call yourself a Christian? No compassion, no forgiveness. How do we have these characteristics, godly characteristics of showing mercy and compassion? What good is the money going to do me in the bank? It's not. What should I do with the money that's in the bank? Take care of my own household first. If I don't, I'm worse than an infidel, and I have turned my back on God. My responsibility as a Christian is to make sure that my family is taken care of during hard times. Well, Joe, you need that money for a rainy day. No, I don't. The rainy day is coming, and the money's not going to do me a bit of good. I just showed, showed you, you and I can't survive on the money in the bank. It's worthless. You and I can't survive on how much food we store up, how much water we've got stored up, how much solar energy we might tap into. That does not cut it. Unless you and I are built on the rock, we will not survive. What's coming? When this nation loses its freedom of religion and is just around the corner. Cease from yielding fruit. What, what's the fruit? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, mercy, kindness, faithfulness. Do we exhibit those characteristic traits today in the time of plenty? How do we build these characteristics in our lives? First of all, we need to ask God. Show me, O oh God. What David said, show me. Show me what's wrong with my life. Show me how I need to change. Show me why I'm suffering. Show me why you're not healing me. Show me why I'm in a drought. What lessons do I need to learn? Am I fair? Am I equitable? Am I kind? Am I generous? Oh, I've got to be concerned about paying my bills. I can't be concerned about paying yours. You're, you're, you're on your own. Oh, by the way, you're not in the church. Now, if you was in the church, maybe, maybe I'd be a little gen more generous. Just maybe. But you're a heathen. You're a Gentile. You're an outcast. And what did Jesus Christ say? Who showed this man any mercy? Who showed mercy to the man who got robbed, beaten up, and thrown in the ditch and left to die? Was it the priesthood? Oh, no. How many ministers of God would be involved? We need to ask that question. What kind of lives are we living as, as ministers? Number two, Levites. Who's of the house of Levi? Who's going to minister in the temple? We are called to be kings and priests. Would the church be involved? Or would it take some Gentile out here to come by and pull the man out of the ditch and take care of him? Do we have love for our neighbor and for an enemy? How do we have that characteristic? We have to seek God. We have to ask God for that. It takes a mental transformation. It takes a changing of the mind. It takes a, a reconstruction of the mind. Get rid of that garbage. I call it worldwide garbage. Get rid of it. Analyze our lives. How close to God are we? How much do we think like God and act like God? And if we don't, study God's word. Where do we fall short? It is given for instruction and correction. That's what Paul told Timothy. He told him to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that is not ashamed because he can rightly divide the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. He tells Timothy in verse 14, But as for you, 
continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Are you and I able to explain to someone that the Old Testament is not a done, done away with? Can you and I explain what was nailed to the stake? Can you and I explain three days and three nights? Can you and I explain God's plan of salvation? Are we able to do that? What's the job of us in the world tomorrow? Is to be a priest, to teach. Can we teach our children? Can we te teach others? What if someone calls you up on the phone or calls me on the phone? Can I answer their question? Do I know where to turn to find the answer? Timothy was told to be steadfast in the scriptures, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is our foundation. He says that from a childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. What was Joseph's purpose of becoming wise? Why did he learn how to be a good businessman? Why was he working for Pot uh, Potiphar? Why did Potiphar buy him in the first place? Business skills. He was intelligent. He was astute. He could understand. He could learn the language. He was excelling until the wife got involved, ended up in jail, dungeon. But the jailer understood that he had certain skills and used Joseph until the time come when Pharaoh called him out. Wisdom. We are to learn from God's word. We are to apply it in our lives. Able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that's what Joseph did. He, he was able to save mankind from a famine, from starving to death. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Sound foundation. The doctrines of the church, do we know them? Do we understand them? For reproof. There is time to rebuttal someone for correction. We all need personal correction. We all need to wake up to the fact that we are missing the mark in some area or another. For instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete, perfected, reaching the statute and the measure of Jesus Christ who is the Son of God, and we are to reach out for that. And we are to lay up treasures in heaven and not here on this earth. Yet God judges us by how we deal with the unrighteous mammon. He knows we're physical. We live in a physical world. How are we doing in this physical world? Are we rich toward God as well as to our neighbor? that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How to survive a famine? We need to be on our knees before the Almighty God. We need to be filled with His Spirit. We need to be acting upon that Spirit. That Spirit needs to be flowing through us and out to other people so they see the kindness, they see the mercy, not just in word, but in deed. Because James says, you say you have faith. Well, yes, I have faith too, but here's my work. Here's what I'm doing because I trust in God. I lay my life down for other people. I go out of my way to help people. I do these things. I don't jump to conclusions. I don't falsely accuse. I don't. Can we, can we say that? How do we measure up to the statute of Jesus Christ? What kind of life did he live? He took it. He was abused. And he took it. Famine's coming. Not just a physical famine, but a spiritual famine. Will you survive?
will I survive? We need to make sure we survive spiritually because God is able to pour out upon us the physical things that we need when we need them because all we need to do is remember Elijah who was sent to a widow in the town or in the country of Sidon. And she was eating her last meal, preparing for it. She survived the famine. It was her last meal. She survived. How? Because God made sure that when she went to make a meal, there was that cup of flour in the bottom of the bin, and there was enough oil in the cruise to make a meal. Oh, no, he didn't pour out barrels of oil and basketfuls and, and sacks full of grain. One meal every time they needed to eat. Day after day after day. Is God that far from us that we doubt God to be able to spare us physically? Because if we are, we haven't even got close enough to God to understand the spiritual aspects of it. Because God wants to make sure you and I survive spiritually through a famine, not of bread and water, but of hearing the word of the eternal.